here I am again. <laughs> I mentioned some things um, this week, for example, and this is um, just the kind of things that um, I notice very frequently. Um, I think it's related to uh, meditation and spiritual practice. In fact, I know that it is because the more I meditate, um, the more frequently I experience um, very unusual events, but they're actually very common. They happen all the time and I notice them all the time. So, um, yeah, so I'm going to give an example. The first one is, okay, an example, and the other one actually extends through three days. And this is stuff I've been noticing for years. I've commented uh, to different people that are close to me to see if they experience the same thing or if there's any uh, any, th any information that they, or any response that they have. Um, I do know that certain things, for example, like deja vu, I don't have deja vu anymore. I remember when I used to have it a long time ago. Um, but what I think happens is, um, a person's awareness, <clears throat> you know, is there's a certain amount of awareness that a person is looking through. And, um, then um, there are different things that can expand that awareness. And so when you see um, a larger picture, um, it sometimes transforms different experiences. So for example, instead of um, deja vu, I actually don't get deja vu anymore. What I get is precognition. I'm actually able to um, recall specifically what I saw that is now being repeated. Um, had I not seen that, it probably would have been in my unconscious mind. And when I would have experienced it um, happening again, it would have probably felt like deja vu. But I no longer get deja vu instead of deja vu. What I experience is precognition. So what I describe that as or what it feels like is that I was looking, you know, through this much and now it's gotten a little bigger. And so now instead of deja vu it's precognition. Um, and I feel like I would like this to happen with the, this next thing that I'm going to talk about. I feel that it's starting to happen a little bit and I'm starting to see the connection to a broader picture. So, um, anyway, yeah, so I'm going to talk about it. It's basically, um, these things that happen and they are unusual and they'll happen one right after the other, like all within a really short period of time. And I remember, I don't know if it was like a statistics class or if it was like a class that had statistics in it um, that I remember learning about is where unusual things will suddenly start happening in succession. But there's no real explanation. That's a, a phenomenon and it's a phenomenon. But um, so I'll give an example and then I'll give another more detailed example. And this is from the last week because this happens very often. But these two, it was like back to back. So um, I'm a PE teacher. The students had um, choosing uh, choice activities. And so I brought out a cart. And this is actually not like a shopping cart. It was like a one that has two wheels. It's a little more vertical and it's got a handle and I have to kind of tilt it to pull it on two wheels. So the opening is rectangular and it's not... Um, it's kind of, you know, like if you wanted to shoot a basket into it, I mean, I'm sure, you know, kids sometimes attempt to do that, you know, like when it's time to put equipment away, they try to shoot equipment into the basket and then kids do that. But this, this wasn't what it was. This was, um, the kids were playing. It was actually my class and another teacher's class. We were within certain courts and, um, I was there next to the cart. So it's not like the kids were running around with the, you know, equipment cart, um, and I was basically monitoring a certain area that kids were not allowed to just kind of f freely run into. Um, and so, <clears throat> and of course I was supervising the kids. So, um, so what happened was this wasn't during cleanup time where the kids were putting equipment away. The equipment was out and, uh, and students were playing and then suddenly a student threw a ball, you know, quite quite hard and uh, and it landed in the cart um and which is like okay that happens you know all the time you know I mean when kids are putting equipment away and stuff but it doesn't happen as often um just in regular play because they're not really supposed to be doing you know what I mean so um but in this case like the student wasn't trying to get the ball into the cart 
Um, and it wasn't clear, like, if the student was actually throwing the ball to a student. I don't know. But anyway, there's students around and they reacted like, whoa, you know, like kind of like, whoa, what are the chances? You know, you kind of threw the ball and didn't even really know where it was going. And it ended up landing in the cart perfectly. <clears throat> and this is kind of a long, again, long, like vertical cart. I saw that. It's right next to me, obviously, because I'm next to the cart. Um, and so I'm like, okay, whatever. But then what will happen is then the next class, it happened again. So obviously those students left and now they're in their next class and I have a whole new set of students. And again, it was a student that wasn't trying to throw the ball um, into the cart. The student was just throwing the ball. And again, I don't know if the student was throwing it so to another student. It didn't appear to be the case. It's just interesting how the student threw the ball quite intensely. And it landed in the cart and the students were like, whoa, you know, like, wow, you know, because it's like, you know, what are the chances? You know, that's not really an easy shot. That cart is not too, it's not some giant cart, you know, um, it seems quite unlikely that that would happen. So usually right about the second time something um, unusual um, happens because this is not something that commonly happens. Kids aren't throwing equipment around and the ball accidentally lands in the cart. Um, it's quite unusual, and so it's obviously more common when a kid is intending to do it and they're trying to make a basket and it'll land, um, and even then, obviously, they don't make it, you know, every time they intend to. But uh, there's this feeling that surrounds this kind of event, and I felt like, oh, it happened a second time. So it, usually at the second time that something like this happens, I know that it's going to happen a third time, and it always happens if it's, if it's this thing that happens, um, this cluster of three, I, it, it's three times. It doesn't happen four times. It doesn't happen two times. It happens three times. So, um, when that happened, I was thinking, wow, okay, so this is going to happen again. Like at some point in the day, this is happening again. So I'm doing my routine in that area, what I have to do and what agreement I have with the quote coach in terms of where I'm standing and what I'm like, what I'm doing and monitoring and what he's doing. And so, um, that's what I'm going to be doing for the rest of the day. I'm going to have the cart next to me, you know, and the students all had the same lesson plan um, for that day. So I just knew like, okay, there's this feeling that goes along with it. And it's this like, sort of, it's a pleasant feeling. Um, it's, like the same feeling I think every time that that happens and that's kind of how I pick up on it I start kind of noticing it after the first time like hmm I can kind of feel that feeling and then when it happens a second time I'm like okay it's definitely happening a third time I'm not making it happen I mean like I it's you know what are the odds of it happening okay, you know, balls are flying around and there's a cart there. There's, there, I'm sure there's some mathematical calculation for what the odds are, but what are the odds of it happening three times within a few hours? Like that's, that's pretty rare. It would be very rare as I'm thinking. And, you know, many, many months it happens zero times, you know, or how many times in a year would something like that happen? I mean, it's actually not that common for a kid to throw a ball the way that it was done just throwing it, just suddenly for whatever reason, throwing it and it landing so perfectly in the cart with such intensity. <clears throat> and uh, the intention of the student wasn't to have it land in the cart and for it to happen again, three times, three different students, three different classes. So it's not like there's some sort of plan to happen or the lesson didn't wasn't created in a way where it would make that occurrence more likely. So then, of course, shortly after, in another class, it happened again. And again, the kids reacted. It wasn't intentional. The student that threw it wasn't trying to do it. And there were students around that cheered. So it was the same thing, the same reaction. You know, students around the situation reacted. The student that was throwing the ball it was the same. It wasn't the same ball. Like one time it was a football. One time it was another, you know, other pieces of equipment. But it was the same thing, like just this throw suddenly, and then it, it ended up in the cart. And it just seems like, wow, that's really unusual, you know? Like if someone were to throw a ball up suddenly, you know, and throw it behind them, and then it would land in a basket, you know, in the basketball hoop or something. It had that kind of feeling to it, like, wow, how improbable, and look, it happened. So it happens three times. So usually by the second time it'll happen, and this happens in different situations, 
It's not just at work. It happens while I'm driving. It happens. And again, it's this observation of um, usually an, an odd thing that happens, something that usually doesn't happen, whether it's a, a maneuver, uh, some sort of something that's happening, um, and it's unusual, and it will happen three times. So, okay. Not totally sure what it means, but I'm hoping that that expands because I've been wanting to know why is it that I observe it and why is it that it's three times and why is it that it's always three times? I did end up talking to a friend of mine. I mentioned this three, the things when I noticed things happening in threes um, and I mentioned it to him like, you know, what is it, you know? And um, I think calling him psychic is probably a mild way to describe him. Um, and he responded with, you will understand why, why that is. And so, uh, that's good. <laughs> I feel good about that. Um, to find out why it is that I end up aligned, um, in a way where I observe events happening the way that they do. I guess the time will come when I will know that. So that is one of the things, um, which is this cluster of three that I've noticed for years. And another thing, and I'm hoping that my view of that expands. Um, another thing that happens, and this again is common, and I'll give the example by just sharing what happened um, on Thursday. And what I like to do with teaching is I have lesson plans and I have, you know, obviously a variety of different options depending on the needs of the students. Every class is different. Um, teaching strategies um, vary. Um, paces of different classes are different. So every class is different. Every student is different. The things that they need to learn are the same, but they don't always learn them at the same pace and in the same manner. And so sometimes there are periods of time in class where, you know, we went over stuff and I open, I sort of, it becomes this, you know, there's some improv there where I'm receptive to the students, I'm listening to the students, and there's this period of time where I can suddenly incorporate an activity into the day. And I like that because I like listening to students where they are. I like taking things that are that they find interesting and seeing if there is a way to incorporate those things into class. And so it's me extending myself to the students and the students extending themselves to me where I'm learning from the students and I'm taking their interests and things that they know and I'm finding ways to incorporate it in the class and at the same time teach that which I'm I'm supposed to teach and I'm using um, things that interest them. So we had this period of time and I was like, okay, you know, I mean, there are certain activities that we can do, um, but I was open to listening to students and suggestions. And so there were a couple of kids around and I'm like, okay, some activities. And one student was like, we should play cat and mouse. And just the energy of it was like, okay, like, how do you play it? And so I'm listening to it. And obviously, while I'm listening to the rules, um, I'm planning on how it is that we're going to give the instructions out, whether it's an appropriate game, what content standard, you know, what standards I can, you know, or can be taught through that lesson and how it could be implemented in the environment that we're in. And we were indoors. So I go through and I'm basically, as I'm listening to him, like approving the activity in my mind and already starting to develop, to develop ways that we're going to teach the, um, the activity and we're going to implement it. So um, we go through it and the students play cat and mouse. Um, that actually carried over into several classes over two days. So there's a, a portion of the day where we played cat and mouse. And so cat and mouse, right? And it's a cat chasing a mouse, right? So cat is chasing mouse. So I'm doing this for two days. On the second day, um, I'm going, you know, to class and there's a mouse that runs, you know, that's just running on campus. And so I notice the mouse. I'm like, okay, you know. There's mouse there, so. The mouse is, I'm sure the mouse is probably hungry looking for food, you know. And then, um, and this is Friday. 
um, we play cat and mouse. And then um, that was basically out of everything that we did that day, that was like the high point in the class. That's where the kids exerted themselves the most. That's where their emotions were the most intense. And that's what they appeared, at least most of them appeared to enjoy the most. And where their focus was, was quite intense. They were really into it. So it's really neat. Then on Friday, you know, um, a friend of mine, one that owns, um, her and her husband own an estate sale business. She texted me to ask me if I wanted to work in estate sale. So when they have estate sales, um, they actually live in a different County, but, um, they, um, do a lot of estate sales in the County where I live. And so they call me, Hey, you know, you want to work in a state cell and they'll pay me. Uh, state cells are usually on the weekends. And so, um, sometimes I like to take the weekends off, but sometimes I like to go to the estate cells. It's activity. Um, usually, um, and again, this is a, a liquidation service where they go in. It's usually a person that has died or they have moved to assisted living, or sometimes it's a combination of those two things where one person dies and one person moves to assisted living. Um, uh, very rarely it's downsizing, but sometimes it'll be that. And so there's a need for that, that estate to liquidate. Um, and so they need to clear the items out of the home. And a lot of times they're going to sell the home or they're going to rent the home. Sometimes um, even vehicles are for sale, fixtures are for sale, major appliances are for sale, um, sometimes not. So there's just, there are different sales, every sale is different. And so it's interesting for me to go because um, you know, you go into a person's home and you see how the community comes in. And a lot of times you hear sometimes their neighbors and, you know, they just have things to say about the family that lives there. And it's usually this positive, uh, interesting experience There are also collectors that come in and it's this, um, it's this environment, it's, it's this community of estate sale people, as well as the community that the home is in, um, as well as um, my friends do a good job of when it's, um, not always, because when it's permitted, when the family wants to share information um, about the family, my friends do a good job of learning about the people that lived in the home and what their hobbies were, if they were travelers, what they did for a living, where they worked, if they were in the military and so on. And when people come in, a lot of times they ask questions they want to know. And so information is shared about the lives of the people. Sometimes that's not, um, there's like a fiduciary. Sometimes there are attorneys that manage it and there's not much information we have on the family. Sometimes, um, community members will know and they'll come in and share. Um, like sometimes it'll be, you know, like a, you know, a dentist or something that owned the home. And sometimes this patient I remember once came in and neighbors that, um, you know, just interesting relationships. And so I think it's nice sometimes to work at, um, I'm around friends and I'm also experiencing this, um, interesting, uh, community, uh, situation that happens. So, Okay, so I said, yeah, you know what, I can work one day. Sometimes I'll work two days of the state sales. Sometimes if um, I'm on break from work, from, you know, working as a teacher, I'll, if there's a three-day sale, sometimes I'll do three days, you know. Um, so I said, okay, I can work one day. You know, what day do you think is best? She said, Saturday would be good. I'm like, yeah, I can do Saturday, you know. So, okay. So now my friend and her husband live in a different county. You know, they don't know about my lesson plans. They don't, um know about what I'm doing at work with my students. They don't, you know what I mean? Like they don't know what I'm doing at work and what activities we're doing. Like there's just no way there's no connection there. They don't work in schools. So then I go on Saturday and everything's already staged. Everything's ready to go and it's being um, opened up to the public and I'm there to assist in um, you know, keeping things organized and assisting people that are purchasing and so on. And um, so I'm there. Well, I walk in and it's the first living room there. Um, there was this antique uh, chair. It's a school chair. You know, the ones that have like a cubby underneath. It's a wooden one, cubby underneath, and it has a desk attached to it. And on top of it, and that's, that was vintage. And then there was this other vintage um, on top of it sitting a board game. 
and it looked like a vintage board game and it was Tom and Jerry. And on the top of it, it had a cat chasing a mouse, right? Tom is chasing the mouse. I'm like, okay, cat and mouse, right? I was playing cat and mouse at work for the past two days. I saw a mouse outside. Now I'm here at the estate sale. There's a school chair, right? School and a game. Here it is again, right? School and game. And it's a cat chasing a mouse. So that's cute. You know, I'm like, okay. So at that point I got this feeling again, that's associated with these types of synchronicities, which I think it's um, extending beyond synchronicity, just like deja vu. There's a bright, broader um, perception beyond deja vu. There are broader perceptions beyond synchronicities. And I'm going to go into that in a little bit. Um, so when I saw that, I'm like, okay, so I'm not telling anybody that I played cat and mouse. I mean, we're all busy doing stuff and I'm not, but I did, um, take a picture, a couple of pictures of the chair, the desk chair with the Tom and Jerry, um, board game on top. So Just thought that was neat like a game you know and school there that energy is there um so the energy for the past two days is there so then you know a couple of hours later i'm in the garage tidying things you know walking around tidying things up and um there's a mom and, it, and this child and they say oh there's a mouse inside of this trash can and there's this little trash can kind of like a little office trash can and they said there was a little mouse inside and i said oh, okay i'm like you know He's probably hungry. He's probably looking for food. I'm like, I will get something and put it on top of the trash can and take the, the mouse outside. So they walked out of the garage and then I just took something and covered, you know, gently covered the trash can and carried it outside in the front and I set the little mouse free. And, you know, brought the trash can back and everything. So I told one of my friends, I'm like, oh, you know what? I went outside and I just, I let out, you know, a little mouse, you know, that I let the little guy free. And uh, my friend, he said, he's like, really? There was a mouse in there? He's like, huh. He's like, you know, we were cleaning out our house. And um, and he mentioned the area. And he said, um, yeah. And uh, and uh, there were, it was like a hoard. I guess it was a house of, you know, sometimes people will hoard, you know, and they'll have, you know, very large amounts of stuff inside their home. And so he said that the house was like collapsing and it was, it, it was this massive amount of stuff in it. And he said, yeah, there were, um, there were rats and feral cats in that house. And he's, he's talking about how intense it was. And I'm like, wow. Yeah. Wow. But again, it's like, it was this energy of cat and mouse, cat and mouse for three days, cat and mouse, cat and mouse, these unrelated situations. As I go through them, they connect. And so I'm at school. We're playing a game there's a mouse outside, then I don't know I'm going to go to that estate sale. I don't know anything about the home or the family, nothing. I just say, yeah, I'll go. Okay. You know, it just felt like it felt right. I show up, there's a school chair with a game of a cat chasing a mouse. I actually looked at the game. I turned it around and stuff. And it, and it basically the whole object of the game is for Tom to catch Jerry and Jerry's off trying to get cheese and when before Tom catches them. And then there's a mouse that gets taken outside. Then there's something about a mouse being outside. So, um, yeah. And so it's three days and it, it does have this interesting connection. It does have a magical feeling associated to it. Um, but what starts to happen, I feel, and this is again, connected with meditation, meditation sharpens the senses, meditation, um, aligns a person, um, and it strengthens intuition. And so there's this feeling that feels really, really good in meditation. And what happens is, um, when I'm not in meditation, I, um, very often will feel that feeling and I want to continue in that feeling always. But what happens is that, um, like when the boy said, for example, let's play cat and mouse and, and it just felt right. Um, when my friend asked me, let's go to the, you know, you want to work at the estate cell. It felt right. And so through all of that, I was able to see that there were very similar energies that were there. Another thing that was interesting is that at school there were at, at work, 
there were two locations that were mentioned by people, two cities that were mentioned to me. And for some reason, it stood out, you know, by two different people. And it just stood out. It ended up being that um, that the estate sale that I went to work at was at one of those locations. And while I was at that location, someone mentioned that other location. Like, you know what I mean? Like, there is no other, like, not, like you know what I mean? Like, what else is being mentioned? But, like, so I just thought it was interesting. Like, there was someone that was specifically, like, what is the address here? Like, this person was asking me because they were on the phone with somebody at the estate sale. And they're like, yeah, what is the address here? And so I took my phone because it was in the text message that my friend sent me so that she could see the exact address, which is, like, you know, in this, you know, obviously I'm looking at this is where I'm at. This is where the sale is at, and I'm looking at it. And as I'm looking at it, she mentions the other location. And um, what starts to happen is um, – through that feeling and just kind of through seeing how things are connected, um, a person is able to then start to predict what's going to happen and within can start predicting what's going to happen. And they're able to list like something's going to go on in this city or, you know, this city in this city, you know, this and this, you know what I mean? Like as it starts happening and you get a feeling that it, this is an energy that's going on for this time period or for these days. And what will happen is um, you start being able to predict what's going to happen or, or elements that will be present in future um, events and future locations and circumstances. Because it's a set of things that happen. Again, it's unusual. I mean, you know, and then it happens again. And so there's, yeah, it's attached to being able to predict. Like you start figuring out, oh, this is one of those situations that is these elements that are here are going to repeat themselves elsewhere. And I'm going to end up seeing it again. So, um, yeah, so synchronicity ends up turning into like pre a type of precognition. Um, and things like deja vu, for example, um, also... Uh, for me anyway, is linked to precognition. Deja vu, though, um, is actually, um, I don't get deja vu anymore. What I get is a dream that will tell me, you know, what's going to happen. The things in that dream, those main events, and, and again, these are unusual events, things that don't happen every day. Uh, oftentimes, it involves people I don't know and have never met up until like I've never met, you know, that end up in the dream. Um, and then it happens. I've had a couple of them where an exact date shows up and then, um, and then on that exact date, something will happen that whatever it is in that dream will happen. Um, and it, again, these are things that I don't have control over. I don't know how exactly how they're going to manifest, but I can list the major things and the people and what they look like and the events and stuff that'll happen. So, Anyway, I think that um, meditation is um, crucial because it's, again, the connection, connecting the waking mind and the sleeping mind and being in that trance state and uh, connecting with intuition, connecting with feelings, because I believe that the unconscious mind a lot of times connects through feeling. Uh, it's a really good feeling. It's a, a calm, wonderful feeling. And I find that the more that a person connects with that intuition and that guidance, the stronger it gets and the larger a person's perception gets. So, um, yeah.